No success in the world can compensate for failure in the home. That's why Club Wealth was founded, to help driven, successful, and busy real estate agents like you double their business while building a strong, balanced home life. Join us each week as high-producing agents and team leaders share their stories and unpack the principles and systems they've used to double, triple, and even quadruple their business while enjoying greater quality of life. And now, here's the latest episode of Club Wealth TV. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Club Wealth TV. Super excited. Uh, not only is this episode uh, going to be live on Facebook, and we're in several different places on Facebook, but we're also uh, going to be broadcasting this as a podcast. So we now are making Fancy. all of our Club Wealth TV episodes into a podcast. And uh, so you guys will be able to listen to it in your car and all that good stuff. I need to do my Jefferson's dance. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That's I'm not even awesome. sure what to do with that set of information. <laughs> I'm, I'm just wondering if Brian can do that too. I'd love to see Brian, Brian and Brandon try and, you know, whatever it was you just did. I, I know I don't have those Brian. kind of. <laughs> well, anyway, today, folks, we are here with obviously you guys already know Brian Curtis and Sheree Benjamin. Brian and Sheree are both coaches with Club Wealth. And uh, both do freaking awesome in their respective markets. Brian is in the hustling, bustling metropolis of Bentonville, Arkansas. And uh, they just got a second, not now, now that they don't just have one, they have two stop signs in town. So we're excited to be. We got a Starbucks. And, and a Starbucks. It's funny. They get two Starbucks or two stop signs and like six Starbucks there. So true story. <laughs> like, like most small towns in America. But uh, anyway, super stoked to have Brian with us. Brian, as you guys uh, may know, does uh, just over 330 transactions a year. So he's a baller. And uh, of course, we've got Cherie Benjamin is in the house. And Cherie Benjamin, uh, the story behind Cherie is that when we met Cherie, it was just her and I believe a part-time assistant. And within 18 months, she had 25 people on her team. And uh, in the last 12 of her first 18 months with us, she did 250 transactions. This year, we're counting on Cherie to close over 500 transactions. So no, no pressure. pressure. <laughs> Better pick that up. Let's make it happen. So very excited about that. And today's guest, and by the way, Sheree is in Atlanta, Georgia. Thank you for putting that in your uh, in your Zoom profile there. I love it when you do that. Uh, and Brian and Brandon, if you get a chance, you guys could do that as well. But let me introduce to you guys today, Mr. Brandon Landro. Brandon is in the home of Cheese Country, USA. So essentially, there. What's that, Brandon? Cheese, beer, and football. So Cheese, beer, and football. That's essentially what they got. And snow, apparently, lots, yeah. and lots, yeah. and lots of snow. So, which is why I live in Seattle. But uh, that being said, Brandon's a stud. Brandon does very, very well as well. And Brandon, we're going to follow Brandon's story from we were teasing earlier. We're like, as a young boy, how he started in this world as a young boy and grew to become a man and eventually, you know, got into real estate and built his uh, real estate empire. And now he runs a broker Janda team, uh, as does Brian now, by the way. And, uh, and Brandon, is doing, I think you're going to do what, just over 500 transactions this year as well? Is that kind of where you're at? Yeah, we're just shy of 200 right now for the year, so. Oh, holy cow, 200 closed already, and it's no, what? No, no, written. So the closings and the pending, so. Sorry, the closing longest, and pending, yeah, I'm sorry to myself. overstate what you have accomplished <laughs> this year so far, because, you know, there's a lot of people watching that have already written, you know, 200 transactions this year, so <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> Good for you, Brandon. Well, that's awesome. Well, let's do this. Without any further ado, I want to just uh, give Brandon a chance to introduce himself. Tell us just really quick, Brandon, a little bit about your backstory, uh, you know, just kind of where you've come from. And then Brian and Sheree and I are going to dive right in and we're going to just grill you, man. Uh, looking forward to it. <laughs> um, I got my real estate license when I was uh, 20 years old, which is uh, going on 15 years ago now uh, at the ripe old age of 22. I got my broker's license and left the company that I started with and started my own company. And obviously looking back on that, I think that was one of the craziest things I ever did is at 22 years old, decide to start a real estate brokerage, but seemed like a good idea at the time. Uh, but that was 2006. We started our company and just like everywhere else in the country, 2007 was eh, okay. 2008 was a pretty bad year. 2009 was you know not so good. 
Uh, but I saw the writing on the wall. Uh, I got into REO really heavy uh, when everybody else was sitting around, reducing advertising, dropping out of the business. I didn't have a choice. This was the only thing that I had ever done. And uh, I was married to a real estate agent. So we had a 100% commission household. Uh, actually, back then, we weren't even married yet. We got married in 07. But so in the midst of all that, in my finest year in real estate, she married me anyway. <laughs> See, it pays to be successful. I will, not that year, I wasn't. That's the best thing I did that year was get married. Uh, but now we've, um, we were 10 years in our first location. We were kind of landlocked. We had a small office and uh, I bought a new building, which Michael was nice enough to come out and visit me last year. Um, so we bought a building, renovated it. And now we've got about 6,000 square feet for us and our agents and our team. And with Michael's uh, foot on my back the entire way, I started a team, um, which has been the best thing I ever did. Um, in all these years of real estate, it was fantastic. But our team is up and rolling right now. We've got about 14 people on the team. I've got a waiting list of people who want to interview with us. I've got people that are calling and begging us to take them onto the team. I'm a little more selective than Michael would probably like me to be. I'm way more selective than Damon would ever be. Um, but, <laughs> <laughs> but it's good for our culture. We have a great group and and we're rolling. We've got agents that have been in the mark or in the business for six, seven months who've got 14 deals, 15 deals put together so far this year. And wow. I don't know if you, what your weather has been like, but eight days ago, we were getting 30 inches of snow here. <laughs> so wow, we are, we're supposed to be in the spring market. It's a little bit tardy this year, uh, <laughs> but we're still, yeah, we can tell with your 200 written transactions that the spring market's very tardy this year. It is. We get it. <laughs> Always room for more. <laughs> That's hilarious. Okay, so Brian and Sheree, I, I don't want to monopolize. I want to make sure you guys get in there and you get to ask your questions. I've certainly got some. I've got one. So we hear a lot because we coach a lot. Well, first, we didn't say that that is coach Brandon. That is correct. Brandon is now a Club Wealth coach as well. So super excited. And so if you're a broker owner and you're thinking, or even if you're a team leader and you're thinking, man, I'd really love to learn from this guy that's already written over 200 transactions for 2018 and it's not even May yet, uh, let us know because uh, because Brandon is definitely available. So go ahead, Sheree. So there's a lot of agents who are very nervous to actually start that team. What got you over that hump? What what was it that made you say, I'm going to do it? Outside of Michael's foot being on your neck, what was it? <laughs> well, it was him telling me about 300 times. But the reality of it is being a real estate broker, it's not terribly profitable. There's a lot of, you can be really, really small. You can be you and your wife or you and your partner or whatever. And, you know, one or two people and have like no overhead at all. And then you can make a little bit of money. Most of those brokers, the goal is just, I want to make enough money so I can keep all my commission and whatever split I get from my agents or whatever transaction fee I get from my agents is paying my overhead. And, and you got to keep that very, very low. And then there's that middle ground that I kind of lived in for a long time with 12, 15, 20 agents in my office, the splits from the agents after all the expenses and, and we're set up somewhat like a traditional brokerage, we give a ton of stuff, a ton of resources to our agents. Mm -hmm. And that meant I was the definition of a broker. I was broke all the time. And Michael finally asked me, you know, finally got through to me that if you ever want to be able to do what you're doing and do it profitably and build something that at some point maybe you can sell something you can walk away from something you can go on a vacation from at some point you know i like the background behind brian right now like somewhere i'd like to be somewhere i have something i haven't done in i don't know it's been a long time in the years that i was running a brokerage i took one serious family vacation in 10 or 12 years so no more of that 
So, and by the way, you know, here's the thing. That is a major issue for a lot of people, right? I mean, here you were, you were a broke broker, right? You were struggling and let's call it what it is. I mean, the, the reality was, you know, you're here, you just built this new building and yeah, you were very, you were tight, right? Money was tight and you were giving all this value to the agents and just give, give, give. And not that we shouldn't give value to the agents. Of course, we need to give our agents value. We need to absolutely bring more to the hour than we get paid. That being said, you need to remain profitable. If you're not profitable, it's not about, you know, not only are you never going to get to go on a vacation to a beach like in the background there for Brian, but it's about you may not be in business long term. And if you're not in business long term, you're not doing anybody any favors. You're not doing your family any bit favors. You're not doing your agents any favors. You're not doing your clients any favors. So if you want to be able to really, truly help people, you owe it to them to be profitable. Would you agree with that? 100%. Yeah. It's okay. ab- absolutely the case. And I told Michael right after I finished up, you know, get caught up on books or, you know, the person who does most of my books got caught up on them after the first quarter of this year, there was a $60,000 difference in our profitability from the first quarter of 17 to the first quarter of 18. And the only thing that changed was that I've got a good team working for us now. The market's better. We've sold more homes, but the real change in my business was that we have a team working for us now. And it's not that all of a sudden I made this tremendous amount of money. Last year, I wrote some big checks into my office. And understandably, it was a brand new building. We had a lot of expenses that are just kind of one-time things. Brian's going through that right now and probably sitting on a milk crate. But if you do that, you suffer through it in the beginning so that- Furniture's expensive. Yeah, it is. (laughs) Michael and I talked about this at, at length. When your wife picks out the furniture, it's, it's real. <laughs> well, hey, not, it hey, depends hey. on whose wife. What's that, hey, right? That's, that's, <laughs> my wife went with me. At, uh, I about had a coronary when I found out how expensive furniture was. I was like, good Lord. So. At our I like Lisa. Yeah, I like exactly. <laughs> at our house, too. it's the opposite. It's, <laughs> it's Tara that's like, heck no, you're not buying that. I'm like, but it's cool. <laughs> yeah, no, you, you do have a shiny object syndrome, Michael. So let me ask you a question, Brandon. So um, take a look, just a quick snapshot so we can get a feel for it. How many brokerage agents a year ago did you have? Uh, a year ago, coming in from 16, coming into 17, we were sitting at 16 agents. Okay, and how many do you have now? 26. Okay, and team was? Non-existent. Okay. To 14. Okay. Awesome. So, you know, it's interesting. I I heard this one time and I didn't get it at the time, but I really feel that it's true. And it feels like you're moving this direction and you're seeing a lot of profitability from it is don't be in the middle. In other words, be small, which is fine. You know, you have real low expenses. You've got a couple of people, you're making some money, you, you live your life and it's great don't be in the middle or be big. And it feels like you've made the choice to go big. And, and I, I applaud you for that because every day that I make the choice to go big, it scares the crap out of me, which means that I'm doing the right thing. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I think that that's really an amazing thing that to look at is for all the people out there. And I think you could, maybe you could talk about this, Brandon. Is it any harder to have 26 than it is to have 16? Is it any harder to have two agents on your team or 15 agents on your team? Maybe you could talk a little bit about this. No, I think I think that's a great point, Brian, that no, it's not. There are a couple more things. Obviously, you're going to have as you bring on more new agents, new agents come with more responsibility, with more more education time that you're spending with them, more hand holding that you're doing for them. But you know what? I like that kind of stuff. I like doing the coaching. I I prefer coaching or mentoring somebody over actually going out and selling real estate. No question. Me I too. absolutely love doing Me that. too. Uh, and there you go. Um, so I think that it's just an amazing opportunity. And what I wasn't seeing in the beginning was just your point there that going from 13 to 26, you know, is not twice as much work. It just isn't because I can bring them in in a group. You know, Sheree has kind of patented the process of onboarding people in, you know, school buses. <laughs> but that's what she does because she sits down with them and she has the conversation with all these people. I stopped doing one-on-one interviews because it, at first I thought it's great. I love sitting down and talking about my company and our team and what we're doing. And I'm really excited about it. And I still am. But some of the people that came in, as soon as you shook their hand, you're like, well, it's not going to happen. Yeah. But now I'm just doing it in groups, I'm just bringing them in five or six at a time and talking to them and seeing what they have to say and 
And I also felt like when Jenny, my wife, and I sat down with these people, usually we ask one of our team agents or one of our admin or somebody else to sit in. And we spend an hour with a group of people and they start to really get a feel for who we are as a group because we feed off each other's energy and each other's craziness, their craziness. I'm the, I'm the sober, sane one in the group, but but we've got a lot of energy in our office and the agents that are coming in need to see that. They need to see who we are because I really, it's such a buzzword. It's such a cliche, but culture matters. Like if they don't fit with the group, it just, it just doesn't work that well. You, you're forcing it all the time. Somebody's uncomfortable all the time. And then they're not, you know, not uncomfortable in the way of I'm pushing my business, just not uncomfortable with the people that I'm around doesn't work. Yeah, so no, that's I, not the right kind of uncomfortable. So I'm going to ask you another question, the same line. So when you had staff last year for your office, how many staff did you have a year ago? Two full-time hourly staff. Okay. And today, just for your office, I'm not talking about for your team, how many staff do you have? Oh, for my office, it's for my office last year it was one, this year it's one. So that that's a point I want to make to everybody. So sometimes people look at their they're like, oh, it's so expensive to have this, so expensive to have this. So and they're, you're right. So you've got to maximize out that person because here's the thing: whether you've got one person or 20 people, you need a staff member. Now I don't know the magic number that all of a sudden you have to hire that second staff member, but I know it's not two, and I know it's not three, and I know it's not four. It's way down the line, and I think that's one of the things that people miss. They're like, "Boy, I'm not profitable." So to get profitable, you can either cut way back or you can hire some more people you can bring more people in because again i don't need six front desk people because i've got 40 people on my you know in, in my staff so just understand that and if, if you don't get anything else from listening to what brandon did understand that it's not a one-to-one -one for every agent i need a staff person i don't know the exact ratio but it, there's a definite ratio that happens over time and you don't necessarily just have to go spend more money on staff to hire more agents you know agents are independent contractors and i think sometimes as real estate agents we forget that so yeah. If you are sitting and listening to this and you are like one of the four of us who really does, if you're a team leader and you love teaching and, but you're afraid to hire, think about what you're not doing for people. You're, you've got talent, you've got gifts and you're not sharing that with people. And you, I am more rewarded mm -hmm. by taking a new agent and getting them up and running and turning it into a real career for them or taking an agent who is struggling new into the business or struggling at, an, at another company and showing them that there is a better way to do this and there is a way that your skills will apply to real estate and you can make this work. But if you're a team leader who's just sitting back there and you're afraid to bring new people on, you're doing yourself a disservice and you're doing them a disservice. And I would also say if you're a team member, you're a buyer's agent, you're a listing agent, don't worry about your team hiring more agents. Your team leader is not, you know, there's not a limited amount of us, so to speak. We know how to leverage our time. What we have is going to help everybody. When we hire more buyer's agents and those buyer's agents go out and they do more work and they build our name in the community and we're more well known, that's good for everybody on the team. And a lot of the lead sources that we have almost leverage themselves up. As we get more people, we do more business. As we have more signs in the ground, we get more buyer calls. As we have new agents working in the field, meeting people, we get new listings, which creates new leads, new calls. So all of this, I do hear that a lot. And when we're talking on smaller group masterminds about teams whose team leaders are hearing, well, my agents are complaining that we're hiring people and I'm, I don't know what to do. I'm like, hire the people. Because if you can help them, you should hire them. And I always look at it that way. If I don't think that I can help them, I don't hire them. I don't, I don't want to fail them. It's not the other way around. I'm not worried about them failing me. I'm doing just fine. And whether they're working in my office or not, it's not going to be life-changing to me. But I can be life-changing to them if, if I'm willing to take a chance on them. Okay, that's freaking huge. It may or may not be life-changing for me to bring them on the team, but I can certainly be life-changing for them by allowing them to be a part of our world and helping them out. So a couple of questions we've gotten. By the way, for those of you that have questions for Brandon or for Brian or Shri or I, feel free to type them into the Facebook feed here on Michael Hellickson's Club Wealth Real Estate Coaching page. Uh, and we've got a ton of great folks uh, that are on with us. I see Anthony Alfano, Coach Anthony just joined us. we got Coach uh, David Stites, Linda Ravor, Ron Botello. I mean, we've got a ton of cool 
cool people on right now. Uh, and so definitely thank you guys for watching. But Brandon, here's the, the question that we have from Ron Vitello, and it's a good one. It's where are you getting all these buyer's agents that are staying on your team? How are you finding them? Um, you know what? I should do more recruiting. I will admit that in all of the time that I've been a real estate agent, I've laughed at more other brokers calling my agents and my agents coming into the office and telling me about it, or they bring in the flyers or they bring in the crap that they were sent. I don't do any of it. I truly believe if you are happy and content where you are at a brokerage, that another broker is looking to be self-serving by calling you and saying, hey, the grass is greener over here. You got to leave where you're at. I know it's great, but this is better. You know, sometimes it's not. There's different setups and different fits for different people. So that's why I don't go out and just randomly call and cold call and whatever. If there are people that I meet or that my wife meets or our team meets and they're like, I think this guy is awesome. He was great to work with. Look into him. Yeah, I'll, I'll make a phone call. have a conversation with that guy. But a lot of it is we're putting out ads using Wise Hire, Indeed, things like that. And we're past the point of chasing, you know, just like you want to get past the point of chasing business and you want to attract business. I don't want to chase agents. I don't want to trick somebody. I don't want to convince somebody to come to my office. If they sit down with me for an hour and they don't think it's a good fit, it's probably not a good fit. So I'm okay with that. But we love just doing, letting them come to us. Wise Hire has been a great source. We're opening up an expansion team about 100 miles from our office right now. And in, I don't know, a week and a half, two weeks, we've gotten 18, 25 applicants through there. A lot of them licensed already. People like, be honest, I, we've been sharing our uh, ad that we post. My ad, the first thing in my ad says we're not your typical real estate office, and we like it that way. Oh, I like that. <laughs> That's good stuff. I want to ask you this. So you're with your expansion team, because I know you put a lot of forethought into this, <laughs> a lot of preparation going into creating this expansion team. Maybe you could kind of so walk much. us through that process. Uh, I had an agent who was brand new to real estate, super young, super ambitious. She had a little bit of sales background and she came in and was absolutely blowing the doors off of real estate. It was just amazing. And she was literally working eight to five. She was teaching. She loves to dance. She was teaching dance at night, five days a week. And her sister owned a furniture store. So she was working there on the weekends and killing it there. So I'm like, how are you putting all these deals together? And she's like, I get on the phone. I pick up the phone. You guys give me leads. I call the leads and I don't call until they tell me to drop dead. <laughs> so or die. She was, she was yeah. amazing, and but something, a little change happened in her life. She decided that she needed to move out of market, and she went down to this new market, interviewed with a couple of brokerages, came back to me and said, Brandon, I don't want to work for any of these other brokerages. I want to keep working for you. Can we figure out how to make this work? Uh, so I happen to have a pretty good business coach who's like, heck yeah, you can make it work. <laughs> And just like a lot of you might be have reservations about starting a team or maybe an established team leader who's having reservations about starting an office, I tend to have that analysis paralysis thing all the time. I analyze everything, like a little bit. <laughs> yeah, seriously. I'm here on split screen with you guys, and I've got a giant spreadsheet on my other screen. And that just makes Shocker. me comfortable. It makes me comfortable and happy to have spreadsheets. And oh, my gosh. Uh, that's so hilarious. I sat and thought about that until the opportunity passed me by, and and Michael was smart enough not to let me do that. <laughs> it's been fantastic. And the, cost, the startup costs were minimal. When that's what I wasn't looking at. I was looking at boy, it was so expensive to start a brokerage in the first place. So expensive to build out an office in the first place. And like, I'm just going to double that now. And I'm like, Oh, wait a minute. I'm not going to double that because I'm not opening an office for 26 people tomorrow. I'm opening an office for one person. I'm joining a new MLS. I'm establishing some new relationships there. Um, you know, stuff that I've already learned how to do. I'm like, oh, I just got to do it again. It's, it's not hard. So, you know, Brian used to own a brokerage, decided to work for somebody else for a while and then decided to start again. It's not like, boy, this was the hardest thing I ever did. I mean, your, your hair is a little grayer than it was two weeks ago, but not much. <laughs> it was already pretty gray. Yeah. 
<laughs> I love it. And Mike, uh, Mike Novak saying 200 units so far this year already is amazing. Well done, Brandon and Mike. You're absolutely right about that. And welcome, uh, Bill Fleming, Matt Johnson, Rich Phillips. I love it. You guys are on with us. Tara Helix and the boss is on. Oh my gosh, I gotta be careful. <laughs> and uh, anyway, that being said, uh, totally agree with you. And what's really interesting, first of all, you mentioned Wise Hire. You know, a lot of us are using Wise Hire. Bjorkman just logged in. I know uh, a lot of us use Wise Hire. We love it. Uh, and I posted the link in the group. We get a discount with them. We get a little bit of a deal uh, and that we can pass on to all of you guys. Um, and uh, what's up? Mike's like, hi, stud muffins. I love it. That's funny. Uh, so that being said, Wise Hire is very important. Like it's important to our business. We love it because it creates a volume of people that we can now, uh, you know, add to our funnel for hiring. Uh, but Wise Hire alone is not enough. And I think one of the things that really is keeping in for me, for Brandon, is culture is very, very important to Brandon. And I want to hear specifically from Cherie because of all the people on the call, nobody on this call has recruited as many people in Cherie in the last, let's call it six months. So Cherie, talk to us about recruiting and what's been important for you. So I do, I take a tad bit of the opposite approach as Brandon. Some things are very similar. So we do the same thing for the ads that we put out, but I do call people. I definitely do. I call people because sometimes that phone call changed. And it's something that I was, that I've gotten that before where it's something that I was thinking about. And then someone said something to me, the light bulb went off. I don't do the phone calls as a, hey, we're so great and your other place is not. Um, it's about the opportunity that we have and if you would be interested. Um, I'm very big the same way as you are, Brandon, on seeing if they're a culture fit. So do you have the will? Because I can train the skill. I don't care if you just got done with real estate the day prior to, um, as long as you are ready to go. And I will say that some of my top agents had full-time jobs. When I say jobs, I mean they had a nine to five. They wanted out. They wanted out of that nine to five to switch over uh, to having a full real estate career. Um, but nobody was calling them. No one's calling them. No one's looking at the person who's barely doing any deals per year. And because they are working nine to five, they don't know that some of these opportunities exist. They're not doing the Indeed ads. So Brandon, get on the phone. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so talk to me about some of the challenges you've encountered along the way, Brandon, because uh, you know I, I hear you saying that it's easier than, than people realize. And I agree with you. I think it is easier than people realize, but Talk to us about some of the challenges you've encountered along the way and how you overcame them. Um, one of the biggest things that really changed my life, I've always been really big on continuing to learn real estate is, you know, in Wisconsin, it's 72 hours. You've got a salesperson's license. The day when I got my license, you could finish salesperson's class, take your brokerage license class for a week, immediately following it and open a brokerage. <laughs> and you're a real estate expert. And I knew that that was ridiculous. And so I never stopped reading books. I never stopped what, when YouTube started getting big, I started finding people to follow on YouTube. And at, at one point, it's amazing how naive I was until you really start immersing yourself in the business and you learn all these other things that are out there. Believe it or not, there was a point in time when I didn't know what a CRM was. And I was running a, running a brokerage because I got into a brokerage that didn't have one. I know it was in the Stone Age, but it, it, they were out there. My brokerage just didn't have one. And I didn't know about, you know, how many great coaches were out there. The first coach that I started working with didn't sell any real estate. And, and I won't say that I didn't learn anything from them, but I, I got to a point within a year where I felt like, man, I... I am selling more than this guy ever did in his career. And I know a lot of stuff that I feel like I'm not growing anymore. So I took a break from coaching and then somehow, and I don't even remember how I stumbled across Michael. I had a call with him for an hour and a half and here I am. Um, well, I stopped it, Michael. <laughs> went out and got him. Uh, did you really? Yeah, I did. <laughs> yeah, I did. I looked for a coach for a long time. I went to another event. We're not going to say the name, but I went to another event. That it's was okay. Down. You could talk about Tom. It's not a big deal. He won't care. You said it. So <laughs> <laughs> down in Miami and I stood up for three days straight and did this and went over how I was supposed to go over scripts for three days. Uh, <laughs> so I did. I stopped. I, I did for three months straight. 
for three months straight, I followed. I it, for me, it was very big on values. The person. Yeah. Yeah, it was it's, very. It was very. It's, all, it's an extension of your culture. That's right. And if you're learning from, some, you can't. You can. You can do anything, but it doesn't make sense to me to coach with somebody who is just the moral or the culture 180 from you that you're just like, I, we don't see eye to eye personally at all, but I want to learn about their real estate, you know, knowledge. <laughs> yeah. I got to feel like I can have a real conversation with somebody. It's been life changing for me to have coaching in my life. I started going to seminars and events like mad. The first time that I looked at spending 2000 bucks on plane tickets and tickets to an event I was like, boy, I, you know what? I just won't eat for the next month, but I'm going. I need to do this. And now I had a pin in my office with all these event badges that just got too big and I took it down. But I go to these things religiously because there is no way that you can go and spend three days around really smart people in your industry and not learn one thing that you can make your two grand back on. Yeah. All I got to do is spend three days having fun, maybe at the bar a little bit one night talking to some just just to talk but i learned one thing i go home and i apply it and i sell one house and i made a profit and got three days in dallas or i made three days in you know anaheim or whatever i love it i can't do enough of it if i could be out of my office more often i'd probably go to six or eight of them a year as it is i try to go to four of them a year which if you're not doing that, if you're not coaching, I know that Club Wealth has basically like a, a starter program for coaching. For less than a hundred bucks a month, you can get into group coaching. Do it. There's no way that stop going to Starbucks and <laughs> Brian is yes, Brian's drinking his Starbucks. <laughs> So, but well, there's one thing that, that you're touching on there. And I, I, I think that some of those people, we have some people who are in Club Wealth who don't utilize our masterminds. And what you're saying there on being, not being the smartest person in the yeah. room, that's what you get. You get to mastermind. I, I remember my very first Club Wealth mastermind that was in person. So we have one that's coming up in, what are we, two weeks away? Yeah. From Denver? Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're counting down. We're counting down. But our very first one we had that I went to was in Atlanta and it was here. And I figured, yeah, you were there. Michael was there. There were some big boys in that room. There were some really big boys. Hey, in I've that lost room. weight since then. Come on. <laughs> what are you talking about? I was talking about Mike Bjorkman. Oh, ah, he's on. He's Love, on. You, Mike. <laughs> Love you, Mike. Call Bjorkman out. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> but. I left there with pages upon pages upon pages of notes. When I got home and my husband said, well, how'd it go today? I, I would say to him, uh, I can't talk. My brain <laughs> is so, I, I can't. I needed two weeks to digest everything. And it was a lot. But that's what you get every two weeks at Club Wealth. Now, it's not three straight days, but you do get bits and pieces of that every two weeks by masterminding. And you're not the smartest person in that room. You might have a higher production number, but I can tell you now you're not the smartest person in that room because everyone in that room makes up of something different that you don't have. There's yep. something that you can learn from everyone that's there. So definitely masterminding is a huge key. Masterminding, I love you, Brian. Masterminding took my brain from just regular what I'm getting while I'm coaching to wait a minute. Okay. No. There's a different way to do this. There's a better way to do this. There are people who are doing it and killing it right now. Maybe I should rethink my limiting beliefs that I have. Yeah. Now you're right. The masterminding is the big power. I mean, and don't get me wrong, the coaching's awesome and all the stuff that you get along with it, but there's just, there's nothing that can substitute the power of the masterminding. And I'll tell you, it's, it's a lot of work to put those kind of people, to put people of that caliber in the same room together at the same time. That's not easy. That takes a lot of effort and a lot of dollars sometimes to make that happen. 
Um, but I love that. And so, you know, that definitely does make a difference in our ability to not only grow fast, but to also avoid a lot of mistakes along the way. Uh, and Brandon, to your point, you know, I agree, man, I'm all about, let's get on planes, let's go see each other. And it's funny because the more I do this, the more epiphanies I have and the, and the better I am at working on my business, it's these people that have that scarcity mentality that, oh my gosh, I can't go spend any money on an event or on education or whatever that really struggle. I mean, let's call it what it is They're, you know, they get so caught up in that they they can't invest in themselves that they literally just don't get past those those ceilings or those plateaus that we all encounter in this business uh, in Everybody fact you, be, every individual agent and broker team leader doesn't matter you should be looking at what you're doing as a real business and if you're looking at it as a real business and you don't have fifteen hundred dollars that you can expend on something is it a real business First off, and if you don't have $1,500, I promise you one thing, you're not that busy selling houses. So sit down, make one of these amazing spreadsheets or look in your accounting software and figure out where you're wasting money because that 1500 bucks is there. Yeah. You, don't have to fly, you don't have to fly first class and you don't have to stay at the hosting hotel and you don't have to buy everybody drinks all night. I don't care if you get there on you know, the cheapest flight you can find at the worst hours that you have to take and you stay in an Airbnb in the crappiest part of town, get to these events, start your education. And get your coaching done. So I, here's the thing. Here's the thing. There, I always, when I talk to some people, because I do some strategy sessions every now and then for Club Wealth. And <laughs> <Good> lunch. <laughs> Just a and thank you for so, that, by the way. No problem. So it's a giving thing for me. So when I talk to some people, I actually do tell them, listen, there were a few months that I'm looking at, okay, I'm paying for coaching, but I've got this coming up too. Okay, I'm doing this, but I got this coming up too. Okay, but what's that one thing that I, in my brain, I can't let go of? I can't cut because times are getting tough. I'm not going to cut my coaching because my coaching is going to get me over that hump. I'm not going to stop purchasing my leads. Now I might adjust it if I'm spending money on a lead source that's not quite working, but I can't stop it from coming in. I can't. I can't stop having someone show me the path to get there because they've been there and they've done that. But let's just be honest. Those first, very first three months, if you're coming in and your books were already a little bit tight, you don't have $1,500 there. It is not the easiest, but once you get over the hump, then your business takes off. And there's a lot of people that it's very hard for them to do that. Yeah. So Brandon, here's Bye. a question for you, because obviously, um, you know, it's funny. Shout out to Sunit. I call Sunit the, uh, the event whore. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> but he's, you're, you're not going to quite as many as Sunit, but here's, here's an interesting question. Cause I feel like a lot of people go to events without the right mindset. And I'd like to just, since you go to so many and you, in when I say that you feel like, it feels like you're getting lots of benefit from it and you can almost sit down and calculate an ROI from it if on your spreadsheet, because it sounds like you're pretty high C. So here's, here's my question for you. What do you do to prepare to go for an event? Because here's the thing, if you're going to spend two grand and let's say that's a huge amount of money to you, most people go, oh, I'm going to spend two grand. They hop on the plane and then they show up. And showing up is 80%, but guess what? That last 20% is where you can really make money. So what do you do for, you know, what's your goal when you go to an event and what do you, and how do you prepare for it? One of the ways that I've always prepared for it is knowing or trying to figure out who else is going to be there and making my list. There awesome. are certain people that I need to get in front of. And these could be to Cherie's point, it doesn't matter if they're producing more than you, producing less than you, the same. They're doing different things. So you see an agent, you're like, my gosh, this guy's video content online is just unbelievable. It's what I want to do. He's only selling 25 houses a year, but I just love where he's going with this. Then that's a guy that I'm going to find at that event. One way or another, I'm going to get FaceTime with that guy. I'm going to buy him a dinner. I'm going to sit and sit down with him somehow. And, uh, the people, the group that I usually end up going to these events, I always bring a couple of people from my office. They laugh at me because it doesn't matter if we stay out until the wee hours in the morning. I am up and at those events the first thing in the morning because I'm not missing a minute of any of it. 
I'm staying all night and talking to the last guy who's still standing there. Usually it's Sunit. <laughs> <laughs> but I love him. And he gets to so many because they're all right around him. Southern California has it easy. Yeah, yeah they do. California has it easy. But that's the biggest thing that I do is making a list ahead of time of who are the three to five people that I'm going to find, seek out in these three days. Message them on Facebook ahead of time. You're like, hey, I know that you're going to be out there. I, I hope you're going to be out there too. What day is there a time that we can just get together, spend 20 minutes? I just want to pick your brain and then try to bring something of value for them. Because remember, whatever you do, even if you're only doing 20 deals a year, something you do, you're really good at. Everybody's got their thing that they're like, you know what, this is kind of where I, I live. And that's probably where you need to focus and grow. But if you've got your thing that you're really good at, then be prepared to share that with them so that you're not just there like, gimme, 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 tell me everything. Absolutely. That, to I me, that's that. a huge, huge way to make your events a lot more productive um, is finding out who you need to find. When we did the REO events, when those were, you know, so important mm -hmm. to our business, like there were, there were people and a lot of people going there are looking for the same people, but that doesn't mean that I'm going to quit. I'm not going to be a wallflower at those events and just sit back and watch it happen. Like I'm going to get in the mix. I'm getting out of my comfort zone. My comfort zone is being like the loudest guy in my group of four friends, not the loudest guy in a group of a thousand people. So I, I, I push myself out of that because this is my job. I'm, I'm taking it seriously. I do it for a living. This pays my mortgage every month. So, and I'm loving what you're saying because so many people turn these events into just a big social hour. And don't get me wrong, it's important to socialize. It's important to get to know people and network and all that stuff. But what you're saying, if I'm hearing you correctly, is very similar to the way I approached events when I was selling real estate. I said, look, if I'm going to take time away from my family to go to this event, and let's call it what it is, every event you go to, you are making a choice. You are taking time away from your family. So if I'm going to do that, when I get there, I'm going to be freaking game on. I'm going to be focused. I'm going to make this event make me money. Period. End of story. I'm going to find those things that I need to come out of this event with to go back and actually make money with it. Because anything else, it becomes, and, and I don't want to say it's a waste of time, but I'm not maximizing what I can get out of the event in any other way. Uh, again, the relationships are important and it's, and, and really that's how you make the money, right? Is by, by going out and, and developing strategic relationships and, and, and helping those people. And that's really the key is you've got to be bringing value before before you just start taking value from everybody. And as you do that, you become the mayor of REO Villa or Event Villa or whatever it is, right? Like everybody, all of a sudden, they want to come to you instead of you having to chase them down. They're coming to you to say, hey, Brandon, hey, Brian, hey, Sheree, how are you doing this? And all of a sudden, conversations open up, opportunities open up. And to, you know, online, all of a sudden when there's referrals to be handed out in your area and, you know, shout out to Brian and uh, Sheree who have their cities now listed on their, uh, on their uh, thing. And, and Brandon, you've got Wisconsin on there because heck, you just do the whole state. Cause just you just state. State. <laughs> <laughs> but people have get license will travel. What's that? That have license will travel. Exactly. So anyway, I'm just really glad to hear you say that. Um, because you need to do that. Everybody watching this, next time you go to an event, I'm hoping all of you are coming to Listing Agent Boot Camp. I'm assuming a lot of you are. Um, but when you come out, make sure you're strategic about that event. Make sure you know ahead of time who you need to get to know and come out of there with three people. Don't try and get to know everybody at the event. You come out of there with three people each time that no matter what, you are absolutely going to follow up with after the event and then actually follow up with them and deepen that relationship with them. Everybody wins. So... All right. Good stuff. Brian and Shree, I, I want to get more questions from you guys. More questions. So here, here's a question for you, Brandon. Um, if you had to do it over, because it's always fun to look back and, you know, go, gosh, I'm so brilliant. Because, you know, when I look it over again, I'd love to go back to 2005 when I started doing this and just, you know, have a time capsule and just go smack myself and go, look, dummy, this would work so much better if you do this and this and this. So, if you had to start over, would you start with a team or would you start with a brokerage? If I had to start over, I think I would have started with a team. Okay. And why? Because I think that's uh, the, that's, that's the, the real. Why, 
because the brokerage was the most expensive thing I've ever done in my life. The having the agents in the brokerage is very rewarding to me or it always, it, it always has been, but I found a new silly as it is. I found a new purpose having a team that, that is counting on me, not just to be their broker, to handle it when they get an unruly customer or, you know, they have a contract dispute, which I still kind of like doing that. I got to do one of those last night and sit down and kind of tear somebody apart. But I like doing that once in a while because I know my stuff and I like when somebody tries to challenge me on that, but that doesn't happen that often. And for the most part, the independent agents are doing their thing. You're doing their thing. And we're all just having a good time coexisting together. But the team really becomes so close to you. Everything that you're supporting their business in such a tangible way that the best feedback when I get messages from them just saying, you know, a week ago we took them out to a happy hour and some more herbs and stuff. And just the messages we get on Facebook about thank you for everything that you do for us and for all the leads you provide us and all the opportunity, like it, it gets to you. Like that's what I'm doing this for at this point. I could go, I, I was thinking about it honestly on the way in this morning, like what would happen if real estate just went away? I'm like, I could go work at a car dealership. I'd crush it there. I could go sell insurance. I'd crush it there. There's always going to be something to sell. And the tools that we have when you get really good in sales, they apply to just about any industry. But what I really love about what we're doing is the ability to have a group around you that you are so directly impacting their lives. Okay. So, so, let me, oh, go ahead, Sheree. Okay. Let me ask you a question because there's probably a lot of people who are watching this that are in that little bit of that small stage or they're in that phase of I should grow a team, but I'm very scared to what struggles did you have that you had to overcome in the very infancy, infancy stage of starting to grow your team? What were some of those big key struggles for you? The feedback that, that I get, you know what? I wasn't as afraid of it because we had massive lead generation already going on for just my wife and her I don't know what you call her. I always call Sam Jenny's right hand. She does everything. You can take Jenny out of a situation and just plug Sam in. And Sam is licensed, has been with us for a few years, but she's on salary. She sells some of her own deals, but makes no commission. She's always, she's salary. Um, I think we had a huge amount of leads coming in, so that wasn't scary for me. But I think that's what most people are afraid of is, oh my gosh, if I hire these people, now I got to produce leads for them. And I'm like, but you've got to do that for yourself and it's scalable. Everything you do is scalable, whether it is a free item that you are doing or it's paid advertising. I'm, I'm very big on uh, Zillow, truly a realtor.com and a lot of expensive advertising, frankly, but um, even the inexpensive stuff is scalable. Some of it is just work. If you're not putting flyers in front of these houses with the IBR stuff on them, if you're not hanging the sign riders out with that mm -hmm. stuff, if you're not sending postcards to, to neighborhoods, that stuff is inexpensive. I mean, it truly is. But if you're not doing any of those things, Club Wealth has got some amazing resources with just like here are a whole bunch of free lead sources that you can sign up for. When I started coaching with Michael, like the first thing he did, he said, what do you want? I said, I want more listings. And he's like, here's a, Here's a Trello card, a system that we use. Here's a card full of places you can go and find lead sources for listings. And to this day, I haven't finished that list. It was like 75 items or something. And someday I'll finish. Maybe I won't finish it just so I can always say I've got something else I can do. But I, the first year I was with coaching, that one item that he handed me made me a profit. It paid for coaching and then some because it was all stuff I didn't know about but it was just the education. I'm so good on, on, on the reading, on the self-education. You can't stop learning in this business. Okay, so let me ask you this, because and I agree 100% with you. I think we all have something we can learn all the time. I learn stuff every day, I, and I'm really, I, I'm, I'm encouraged by the fact that there's more out there to learn, right? I'm encouraged that, you know, that keeps us cutting edge, and that's one of the things that sets all of you and all of our teams apart is that because we're constantly educating ourselves, we're first and foremost in whatever's happening in the industry, and that's a big deal. So that being said, we've only got a few minutes left, and we're going to have to wrap up a little bit before the hour, because I 
I've got to go j- jump on another call as well. Uh, but what I'd like to finish up with from each one of you, I would like to know, what are you doing to build culture on your team? And Brandon, before you answer it or as you answer that, one of the things that Michelle Berquist wanted to know is what does a week on your team look like? Are you doing huddles? Are you doing trainings? Uh, are you doing meetings? You know, what is it that makes your team great and really develops that culture? Okay. Okay. It- it's a very good question. Um, daily huddle every day. It's a given. Everybody will get that beaten into their heads in Club Wealth if they don't do it. <laughs> um, For a reason, right? I do. Yeah, I do a weekly meeting. Um, yeah. We have a number of new agents on our team. I have a number of experienced agents, but I like doing the meetings. Um, we spend like an hour and a half together every Wednesday. I had to just move that around. Um, and now we're starting to do, I think we're going to do Tuesday morning trainings, just contract training and things like that for our newer agents. Because again, it's just leveraging our time. We want to teach you guys all of that great information. We want you to be really strong contract writers. I want you to be a really strong negotiator. But just like we do this webinar to share this information with hundreds of people at once instead of two, um, we need to be able as team leaders, as brokerage owners to leverage our time as much as we can to get in front of everybody. So I know sometimes people hate meetings. And if we get to the point where they're not enjoying the meetings or getting things out of them, maybe I would go to every other week, but I've asked and they're like, no, I want them every week. So I'm happy to do it. Um, I make, we do a winter outing where we take them out to dinner and do some fun stuff like a Christmas event or something. We do a summer outing, which is kind of a rotation. We've done golf outings, boat cruises. We've done all sorts of stuff for summer outings. And then we try to sprinkle in a number of events just for our team throughout the year, like little stuff, happy hours or lunches or whatever that we can do for them. And then we do our four client events every year. So there's just constantly times where we're getting together. And Michael gave me one really good piece of advice, um, I don't know, a week or two or three weeks ago, and giving everybody a purpose. And it's awesome as the team leader where every time I think of a project, I'm like, okay, I'm going to add that to my list. I'm going to do this project, this task. And I started thinking when I get these ideas, I'm going to open them up to the team. And I said, hey, we got to get some new apparel and stuff designed. And our team is almost all female. So I'm like, I'm not exactly the most qualified to pick this stuff out for you guys. So would anybody be interested in taking this project on? And two hands shot up. They're like, we'll do it. We'll do it. I'm like, I would have spent how many hours screwing around with that? And they want to do it. They want a purpose. They want to participate and contribute. If you're not on a team that you want to participate and contribute and be a part of, maybe you're not in the right spot. That's huge. I, and, you know, the fact that you're giving them the ability to have input is also very important, right? They want to have a say in the direction of the company, right? And as small as it sounds, the, the, the company clothing, the company apparel, whatever, you know, the logo gear or whatever you guys are doing, that's a part of that, right? And it's a part of culture. I mean, they're going to, you know, do I really want to wear the company shirt? Is it cool? Is it not cool? Like, you know, like don't go out and buy, you know, the, the cheap, you know, run of the mill stuff like for us like for our coaches and stuff you guys know we do nike gear right like get really cool nike polos or whatever you know people want to have a say in this stuff and when you give them that we always say uh to be to really develop culture in an organization everybody's got to have a friend they've got to have a calling or something they can do right some kind of responsibility and they've got to have nourishment right and when what we meant that is they got to be educated by the team leader not just from just anybody but they got to have nourishment from the team leader uh, and it really does matter and there's no substitute for that so okay so wrapping up before we uh, get we, we've got just a couple of uh, like about two minutes left here so Sheree and Brian uh, go ahead and share your parting thoughts and your thoughts on culture you're up, Sheree. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Ladies first. Ladies <laughs> first. Thank you. My parting thoughts is that one, Brandon listened to his coach. That's one of the biggest things is that he listened, even though it might have taken 300 times, he still <laughs> finally listened. And when he listened, he didn't halfway do it. He went all in. And that's something that a lot of people aren't doing. They aren't putting all the chips in on themselves. Um, and you did that. And that's so super rock star status that I love it. <laughs> I just love it. Culture on your team, as you're saying, Brandon, is something that's very big. You know, there's there's some team leaders who don't understand 
each person on their team. Each person on your team's got something different that they can contribute. So they having them have that purpose definitely helps. And it actually makes you so much more of a better team leader because you're learning. I'm constantly learning from my agents, constantly learning from them, which is in turn making us grow even more. Um, so that's one big thing for me on culture. We love on them. You know, we appreciate them, but I'm always learning from them. Every new person that comes on, I'm learning something different, letting them own it. You can be the person to go through to go to for this. You can be the person to go to for that, whatever that might be. But they're all bringing some sort of gift to your team and finding that thing that they have that's within them and then taking that positive thing that they have and just pushing it out. Because every now and then everybody needs a little bit of a push for them to understand how great they actually are. Yeah. Yeah, you're right about that. You know, once in a while people need their bucket filled. Right. Yeah. And, and too often in the world, they don't get it. They, a lot of them aren't getting it at home. They're not getting it from their family, their friends, their, their broker or whatever. When you can give that to them as a team leader or as a broker, if you're a broker, when you can help really fill people's buckets up, they're empowered to go out and do better in whatever it is they want to do, whether it's selling houses or being better with their family or whatever. But you got to help people understand, hey, look, you can do this. You can do it here and you can do it right now. You can actually accomplish this, but they've got to be empowered to feel that way. And a lot of people just, they need to hear that from somebody else. So Brian, parting thoughts. Sure. You know, as I listen to Brandon, probably the the biggest thing I see, and if you want to know how to be successful as a team leader, look to people like Brandon, who's a leader, not a manager. And I, I've, it's a big pet peeve of mine and it's a big thing that I'm pushing towards and I can, I can hear it. You know, Brandon's looking for, to give people opportunities. He's looking to prop people up. He's looking, I didn't hear him once say, well, I sit around and micromanage my team and ensure that they don't, they do everything exactly right. That's not leadership. And we don't have that kind of time for that, by the way. You know, if you've got 14 people on your team, you don't have to sit, you don't have time to sit down and go, did you make your calls today? That's not what leadership is anyway. and, And I appreciate that. And the, you know, the culture that you build everything. So in our new office, one of the things that Lisa and I've been talking about is putting out a thing that says culture matters, literally putting it on our wall. And I think that that's something that, that is very important. Um, I heard some, some people at a, in a previous situation say, the only thing that matters is growth, growth and profit. And I'm like, great. And then, and for the next six months, that'll work for you. And then when the whole thing falls apart in the month seven, let me know. But it really, you know, if, I hear things that, that make sense. Like, you know, you prop your team up when everyone succeeds, everybody, you know, the team does better when everybody does better. I hear all that stuff from you. And here's the thing, in case you guys don't know, leadership sucks. And and what I mean by that is basically on a daily basis, it's not fun and you deal with the problems and you deal with the headaches and you deal with the nightmares. There's a reward at the end of it. And those of us who have had that opportunity, it's it's an amazing reward. But in the trenches on a day-to-day basis, it's not fun. And I and I applaud you for taking on that challenge because you know there's too many people, and I've heard this over and over again. What I want to do is I want to build a team, give them leads, sit back and collect checks. And I you know, awesome. honestly, I, I kind of want to do that too. I just don't know how. Yeah. So, you know, as soon as someone figures out how to do that, let me know. And and I'd like to applaud Brandon for, for that's not what you're about. And I, and I appreciate that. So, I love it. And I hate to do this to you guys. We have got to end it here. I've got to jump on another call. I'm supposed to be on right now. Hey, Brandon, seriously, you are a rock star. And we love you. We appreciate you. Congratulations on all your success and your 200 plus transactions already this year. Good for you, man. That's awesome. And I uh, can't wait. We'll see you soon. And do. Uh, Dude, looking forward to seeing you at uh, Listening Age Bootcamp. Take care, everybody. We'll be uh, back next week. Same time, same bat channel. See ya.